us on in our series today called Truth and Dare as we look at some of the hard truths of Jesus and then dare you guys to live it out. And so today I get to look at a passage of scripture that has been encouraging me lately, challenging me lately, and as we read through it I'm going to uh, pause at different moments as we um, look at this story and unpack some of the things that we 
our reading. And it comes out of the Gospel of John, chapter 6. And the story picks up right after Jesus has done the miracle of feeding the 5,000. So Jesus and his disciples try to get away from this crowd and they go across the lake to continue on, but the people end up chasing after them and finding them, which is where our story picks up. It says it like this. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. And then he says, but don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. It's kind of an interesting thing. You know, this crowd is following Jesus for the wrong reason. It's the next day. They wake up. They're hungry. They want some breakfast. And Jesus basically tells them, if you get so caught up in your own life, in your own temporary needs, you're going to miss out on the miraculous things that I'm doing and that I've done all around you. These people didn't even realize the miracle that happened the day before. And up until that point, they were just following him for their own comforts, for their own appetites. But the truth is, Jesus isn't here just to give us a comfy life and cater to our preferences. Jesus is not looking for more spectators. He is not looking for more consumers. He is looking for followers. And so they replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? And Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, Show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus corrects them and says, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. These people are just like so stoked on breakfast and he keeps talking about bread. And he, they're just like, oh, they're thinking of, totally about brunch. And they're just like, give us this bread every day. And Jesus goes totally spiritual on them and says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. This is what Jesus was about. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given me but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. See, you guys, believing in our culture right now doesn't necessarily mean we change the way we live. You know, we can believe that masks are important. We can believe that they're valuable, and then we go out and, not, and we don't wear a mask, and it actually reveals... We don't believe that. Our life lived reveals what we believe. And back then, believing meant something way different than it does now when we say believe. It's actually back then, the, the word in Greek is pisteo or pistis, which means to believe into or believe on. It's actually placing trust and loyalty into something by adapting and adjusting the way you live to match your beliefs, that your life lived will reveal what you believe. It's not just agreeing with a concept or an idea or a teaching. It was actually following the teacher. So to believe in Jesus is to become like Jesus. It's the simple truth. And then the people at this point began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say, I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I'll raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the father and learns from him 
comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. Okay, so pause a moment. If believing in Jesus means that we become like Jesus, then what did Jesus do? Who did he go to? Who was he looking for? Who is Jesus after? See, Jesus was constantly talking about the kingdom of God and he was constantly revealing himself to people wherever he went. He brought good news. He brought healing. He brought hope and light to people who were looking for it, who were seeking answers, seeking truth. But so often in Jesus' life, uh, he would be looking in the midst of a crowd for who are those people that God is drawing to him. He would gravitate towards those individuals that were searching for hope, that needed answers and hope, and were looking for truth, and he would make time for them and build relationship with them. You know, we see that in the story of Zacchaeus. We see that in the story of the woman at the well. We see that in the story of the woman caught in adultery and the Pharisee named Nicodemus, the people who are looking for truth. He went and spent time with them. So I want to ask you, who in your life needs hope? Who in your life is looking for answers? Because we're supposed to be like Jesus, live it out, walk this out. Go and be with that person. Introduce them to the Jesus that you know and love. Let them have a taste of the gospel. Let them have a taste of the good news. Introduce them to the reason for the hope that you have in these crazy times and share that with them in a place of gentleness and respect. Jesus continues on. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I'm the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. And he points to himself again. I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. Whoa. The people began arguing with each other about what he meant. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They asked, so Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. Now, this piece of scripture, hold up a second, this piece of scripture uh, has received a lot of flack. It sounds like he's encouraging cannibalism a little bit, and it's actually a spiritual concept. It's not like actual cannibalism. Some people just, when they hear that, they think of communion, the little cup of wine, and the little you know, piece of bread that represents the body and the blood of Jesus. But what he is doing here in this passage is he's pointing to our desperate need for the cross, for what he's on earth to do is to die for our sin. And he's pointing us to that. And it's actually talked about in the Old Testament. The cross is mentioned in Psalms 22, which is the Psalm of the cross. And I think there's a, there's a little insight from that Psalm that will help us understand this whole idea of, you know, eating his flesh and drinking his blood. And it gives us a glimpse into the agony of the cross. The Holy Spirit speaks through David and says, but I am a worm, I am no man. And usually in the Bible, the Hebrew word for worm is ramah, which means maggot. But in the psalm, when it's, it's saying this, it's the Hebrew word toloth, which means crimson worm or scarlet worm, that the Holy Spirit is saying, I am a worm, I am no man. And it's actually... Um, referencing the crimson worm, which is a very special worm because when it is time for that little crimson worm, it's just like a little grub. It's not even hardly a worm. When it's time for it to have babies, what it does, and it only does this one time in its life, it finds the trunk of a tree or a wooden fence post or a stick and it attaches itself to that piece of wood. It makes a, um, like a hard crimson shell around it and it becomes so strongly and permanently stuck to the wood, that the shell can never be removed without tearing the body apart and killing the worm. The crimson worm, at this point, once it's attached to the, to the piece of wood, lays her eggs under her body and that protective shell. And when the baby worms, when those larvae hatch, they stay under that shell. Not only does it become protection for those babies, but the babies actually um, feed on the living body of the mother that it becomes their sustenance, their fulfillment. And after a few days when those young worms grow to the point where they're able to take care of themselves, the mother dies. And as the mother dies, this is an interesting piece. She oozes this 
crimson or scarlet red dye, which not only stains the wood she's attached to, but it also stains the young children for the rest of their life, which is where they get that red color. And after three days, the dead mother, crimson worm, the body loses its color, and it turns into a white wax and falls to the ground like snow. And so when the Holy Spirit speaks through David in Psalms 22 saying, I am a worm, it's very interesting that just like that crimson worm, Jesus himself sacrificed himself, gave up his life on a tree, on a cross, so that his children could be born again, being able to have life and have sustenance and feed on him and be forgiven and washed and stained by the forgiveness that he purchased with his blood, that we would be made white as snow. He died for us that we would live through him. So believing means becoming like him. And in this case, you are what you eat. You become like him as you feed on him spiritually. And he continues on, he says, but anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. I will raise that person up at the last day, for my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. It's like this cool intimacy. He says, I live because the living Father who sent me. And in the same way, anyone who feeds on me will live because of me. I am the true bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will not die as your ancestors did, even though they ate the manna, but will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. You know, Jesus invites us to be forgiven, to be born again, to be brought into intimacy and perfect unity and connection to the Father through what he did on the cross. And just like the Israelites would have been hopeless and completely starved to death, without that daily bread in the wilderness, we daily need to bring our brokenness to the cross. Lay it down, receiving the forgiveness that he has bought for us and remind ourselves of the new life that he's put in us. Jesus says, anyone who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me. And he is talking in spiritual terms that he is our spiritual fulfillment, our sustenance, our sufficiency. And he is the only one who has taken on the full weight of sin and death as a person and did away with it, that he died and rose again in victory, showing us there's zero fear in death. And he's given us his identity, his body, filled us with his spirit and joined us to perfect unity with him. And he's always inviting people into that interwoven, interconnected relationship with him. He's inviting people to be in relationship with the God that loves them. And if we're supposed to become like Jesus, if believing in him means becoming like him, then we should be constantly inviting people into that relationship with Jesus. He did this all the time. So I ask you this question, who have you invited into a relationship with Jesus recently? Who have you invited to taste of this new life that he offers? To be joined to the body of Christ, to be refreshed by his forgiveness and his goodness, to have their slate wiped clean. Man, we desperately need this daily bread, this daily forgiveness from him. At this point, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? And Jesus was aware that they, his disciples were complaining, and so he said to them, does this offend you? then what will you think if you see the Son of Man ascend to heaven again? The Spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing, and the very words I've spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me, because Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe, and he knew who would betray him. Then he said, That is why I said that people can't come to me unless the Father gives them to me. It is is an exercise of total dependency walking in the Spirit. And so at this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. And then Jesus turns to his his 12 disciples and asks, Are you going to leave? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life, and we believe And we know that you are the Holy One of God. See, you guys, Jesus was unashamed. He pursued people. He invested in people who were looking for truth. He introduced himself to them. 
and he invites each person to step into the deepest, most intimate relationship with himself to taste of his forgiveness, that he would wash our sin clean and be joined to the body of Christ. This is the whole act of baptism. And he actually says that human effort does nothing. We are not good enough on our own. We need him and that it's the spirit that brings eternal life, being joined to him. And the thing I love about Jesus is that he never watered down the truth and compromised it to make people like him. But he always revealed truth with a healthy portion of grace and gentleness even if people turned away and stopped following him from that point on. And so I dare you guys to not just believe, but to follow. To not feed your mind on the brokenness of social media and life around us, but to feed on him. Because Jesus is not looking for spectators. He's looking for people to follow him, to believe into him. To allow him to be the thing that sustains and fulfills you. And I dare you to introduce people to Jesus, to make them a priority for those people who need hope, who are looking for answers, to actually introduce them to the Savior that you know and that you love and that they desperately need. And I dare you to invite them to follow Jesus with you. Don't just talk about him. Invite them to follow. To invite them to taste of his forgiveness, to taste of being a part of the body of Christ. And I dare you to do it even if it makes you look radical and even if people stop following you on Facebook, stop following you from that point on because we will all come before God one day and give an account for the life that we lived. And the truth is, guys, we won't be judged on what we thought. We won't be judged on our good intentions. And yes, God knows our heart, but he knows our life. And the truth is our life lived reveals what's in our heart. And so, guys, I just dare you to live a life that reveals what you believe, even if it costs you something. To introduce people to Jesus, to look for those folks who are in desperate need of hope and answers. To tell them about your Savior, the hope that you have, and to lead them into a relationship with the God that loves them. Let's pray. God, I just... Uh, I thank you for our community. I thank you for the people that feed on your words, that feed on your identity, that feed on your life, that constantly come to you and depend on your forgiveness, on your love. God, I thank you for the cross. I thank you that we have been born again into a brand new life and that you've stained us with forgiveness. You've stained us with a new life, that we are part of the family of God. God, we believe in you, not just in our minds, God, but in our hearts and in our lifestyle. We want to follow you. We want to re-present you to the world. And so, God, help us become aware of those people in our life that are looking for answers that need hope. Help us to step out and actually introduce them to you, the one we love, the one we, that one we worship, the one we spend our life following. God, help us to invite people into a relationship with you. Help us be obedient and make ourselves available to do that, that you are the good news and you are the hope for people and that there is no eternal life apart from you. There is no eternity apart from you. So Jesus, I just ask that you would put that conviction in us and that our life lived would reveal what we believe. That we would be the body of Christ and we would do the things he did. That we'd be transformed into the image of Christ and we'd grow up into him and look more like him. We thank you for the miracle of new life in you. That you've poured out your Holy Spirit and that you've unified our community, and unified your body through the Spirit of God that was poured out as you rose from the grave, as you ascended to heaven, and as you gave your Spirit to your people, that we would walk in obedience to that. Lord, we just ask you to challenge us in this, that we would share our faith with people and share you with others. Help us walk in your way, Jesus. Amen. Amen.